Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted, uh, obviously, delighted to be here at the RDS. Um, although my talk is about the future, um, every time I come here, it's, it's, uh, I'm reminded of the, the legacy of the past, uh, a very good legacy at that in terms of what the RDS has uh, done for Ireland and continues to do for Ireland as its founders intended. Um, and I suppose uh, today we're shaping the legacy for the future, for future generations and the things that we do in our lives, in our work um, uh, and as citizens. And maybe as part of this evening's uh, deliberations, we can reflect on that uh, as we think about the future, think about uh, the legacy that our children and grandchildren will enjoy as a result of the things we do and don't do. Um, in light of the extraordinary changes now taking place, driven as they are by digital technology and other trends. Um, my focus is very much about the future, it's very much about technology, but I'm not a technologist. Uh, I'm not a, a, someone uh, engaged in the world of science, technology, engineering and all of that. That's more limbs space uh, in the Academy of, of Engineering in Ireland. Um, I'm more interested in the economic and social consequences of change arising from technology. So I want to talk to you about those changes today and what they, they may mean for the future, um, but probably also speculate as well. There's one thing I realize after many years talking about the future is that it has a habit of not turning out quite as you foresaw, uh, but at the same time has a habit also of surprising you in terms of some of the things that, that, that it may bring. Um, and. Um, uh, I was recently talking to some a friend. I was saying that I would probably describe myself as a as I get older as a, as a hopeful pessimist when it comes to change and the future. But you'll see where it all comes from uh, later on. Uh, somebody once said that um, the problem with studying philosophy is that you end up going a bit crazy. Um, sometimes the problem with studying the future is that you end up waiting for the apocalypse. Uh, fortunately, it never comes. So uh, there's a lesson there too in terms of uh, the balance of optimism and pessimism about the future. What I want to talk about really are, are the three things signaled in the title. I want to talk about change uh, and just some of the things that are going on now and, and likely to continue happening in the future and recognizing that we're really only at the beginning of some of those trends. I then want to talk about the challenges um, to prepare you, I think, for future shock, uh, because a lot of what has been anticipated about the consequences of technology is only now becoming manifest in terms of its social, cultural, and economic uh, impact. And then talk about choices that we face about the future here in Ireland, bringing it right back to uh, the things we do and don't do in our workplaces, in our families, in our, in our communities, in our country, uh, and recognizing that there are no easy options and maybe flagging for you a few surprising uh, issues for consideration, uh, be, the, be they uh, for consideration in business or in politics or indeed in, in our families for the future. So change, choice and challenge is very much the theme I want to talk about. Let's talk then first of all about change. I think sometimes there's a value in just looking back, just to understand how fast things have happened. Um, take, say, a timeline that plots the year in which certain technologies were used or adopted by the majority of people in Ireland for the very first time. So take the telephone. It was only in the early 1980s that the landline phone was, a, was available or was used by the majority of people in Ireland. It was only in the year 2000 that for the first time, just over half the population in Ireland had a mobile phone. It was only in the year 2005, less than 10 years ago, that for the first time, the majority of people in Ireland had a computer at home. It was only in the year 2007, the height of the Celtic Tiger, that for the very first time, 50% of the population were using the internet. It was only in 2009, four years ago, that for the first time, half the population were using broadband in Ireland. It was only two years ago, for the first time, that half the population were on Facebook. 
And it was only last year, towards the end, that for the first time, the majority, half the population had a smartphone. So you get a sense of maybe a lot of landmarks or milestones being crossed relatively recently, relatively quickly. And I think it's simply an indicator of almost a, a sense that change is speeding up, that the adoption of technology, digital, digital technologies, is something that's happening at a quickening pace in our society. That's something we've all experienced in the past just few years, so quite extraordinary changes. And one of the important things that we've seen, and this came out of a study we did recently for UPC, is that when it comes to um, broadband uh, and digital technologies generally, Ireland isn't one of the pigs. We're not uh, there with the Portugals and Italys and Greece's and Spain's when it comes to digital technology. In fact, we're about average with the EU when it comes to things like broadband or smartphones or, or, or other services. So in fact, there's a, quite a gap between us um, and the Spain's and Italy and Greece's, which are Portugal's are all over, more or less over to the right hand side on that particular graph. So I think that's important uh, that despite all the difficulties we're well familiar with in terms of the economy and the recession, unemployment, etc., when it comes to the digital economy, we've actually continued growing at a significant pace in recent years. And indeed, right throughout the recession, uh, technology adoption has continued growing in Ireland so that internet adoption now stands at about 80% of, of all adults and um, mobile phones are probably at about 105% of all adults and some people insist on having two or more uh, mobile phones. So there hasn't been a digital recession even in the context of the domestic uh, economic recession that we've seen. <laughs> what is more is that it seems when it comes to digital change, the theme of the first part of my presentation, um, we are neophiles. We love new things. Um, one of the things that we did in our recent survey when we asked a sample of people right throughout Ireland about the impact of the internet or digital technology. For example, I highlight a few here. 44% um, of people said that my family life is better because of the internet. 23% said it's not, but still twice as many roughly said it was better as a result of digital technology. 38%, um, four out of 10 adults say they couldn't do their job without the internet today in 2013. Um, and um, over half of all adults in Ireland say that I wouldn't be able to buy many of the things I want without the internet. So, Bearing in mind that the, it was only for the first, it was only in 2007 that for the first time half of us even were using the internet. Here we are in 2013, um, six years later, and we've got an extraordinary uh, adoption of the technology. And, and as I said, we're neophiles. We actually love what digital technology means for our lives. So that's quite an important change. Um, it's also important in terms of work. Already, for example, um, we know that um, a third of adults say that they uh, use the internet at home for their work. Now, they may not be working all the time, but we've all been in the situation, I'm sure, well, many of us, checking our emails and sending uh, files or links to colleagues, different things like that, answering phone calls and so on. So, the internet and digital technology has now blurred a lot of those boundaries that existed up until, oh, five years ago for most of us, uh, in terms of home and work and so on. And that's another consequence of the speed of digital technology. But it's also affecting the economy, it's affecting our behaviour as consumers. So, for example, here are the things people are buying online in Ireland. Six in ten are buying uh, travel and hotel services. Half are buying clothing and footwear and books. Just to highlight a few of them, um, the clothing sector, retail in particular, has been transformed and is being transformed by digital technology. Even through the recession, 
People have been using the internet in Ireland to switch their insurer, to switch their mobile phone provider, to order products and services online for home delivery, and so on. There are, of course, victims along the way, HMV, for example, but it's an indication of just how rapidly digital technology is impacting um, our lives as consumers. Um, already, there are over two and a half million of us shopping online in Ireland. Last year, we spent just under four billion euro, and that's about three, four percent of all consumer spending online. And in fact, the over 55s are one of the fastest growing sectors in the online uh, digital marketplace in Ireland, spending 0.8 billion euro last year. Um, the share of over 55s in online spending is actually uh, is quite significantly higher than the share of under 25s in online spending. So again, the adoption of digital technology is not something that is kind of ghettoized in a youthful age cohort or anything like that. It's pretty ubiquitous when you start looking at the numbers and start looking at the trends. Um, as for the future, as I said, nearly 4 billion euros spent on, online on the internet last year. Um, it's likely to rise to nearly 6 billion in just a couple of years' time. And when you add in government spending and business to business spending on top of consumer spending, then the internet economy itself will be worth over 11 billion euro in Ireland by 2016. So these are really important, really seismic changes in the economy, indicators, if you like, of the significant growth that's out there. So a huge amount has happened. We've been through all of us in our lives in recent years, in the past half decade, extraordinary change. Is it nearly over? Far from it. I think we're really still only at the beginning of those changes. Um, and the indications so far are that Irish people are looking forward to a lot more of these changes. What kind of changes might we anticipate? Well, um, again, looking at the, the research that we did last year, the survey of a thousand adults in Ireland, we asked about, sorry, we asked about um, interest in future services delivered in your home through digital technology. So for example, um, so I've highlighted a few there, um, getting further qualifications from an Irish university. Half of all adults would like the opportunity to use new technologies to get further education from, from Irish universities. But not just Irish universities, 44% say that they would actually be interested in getting further qualifications from European universities. The boundaries of, of, of geography are disappearing in that regard. Furthermore, over half of adults say they would actually be interested in receiving full medical diagnoses or treatments um, from experts in different hospitals and centres around the world. So when it comes to the potential impact of digital technology on how we live, how we work, how we study, how we learn, how we uh, look after one another in terms of healthcare and so on, the attitude certainly appears to be extraordinarily positive. As I said, we are a nation of neophiles in that regard. Um, and there appears to be no resistance to that change uh, at the moment. Um, so, if that's what Irish people are saying uh, about change, pretty welcoming um, and again uh, a very positive story in terms of uh, the recent domestic uh, saga of the economy and so on, what about further change in the future? Um, there's a particularly um, futurist, uh, uh, Australian futurist, Ross Dawson, uh, I'm a big fan of. and. Um, He's a great guy for producing all of these kind of what's hot, what not lists of uh, change and trends and the future and so on. Um, and this is one that he just brought out literally this week, um, talking about life next year and beyond. The things that we can say goodbye to and the things that we can say hello to in <laughs> terms of digital technology. So what are the things that maybe not necessarily this year, next year, but over the next few years, we might be saying goodbye to uh, in the future. Well, some of them mightn't surprise you. Um, we can say goodbye to uh, printing photographs, uh, to spelling, 
for example, uh, the computer mouse, thanks to the iPad. Um, but there's a few might kind of grab your uh, attention there. We can say goodbye to the eight hours of sleep. Uh, we can say goodbye to switching off. Um, we can say goodbye to shame. Interesting one, you know, in terms of people's perceptions of privacy and so on. And we can certainly say goodbye to privacy. We can say goodbye to the weekday newspaper. Uh, we can say goodbye to focused attention. Um, though fortunately we're getting some of it here this evening. Um, we can say goodbye to bookstore chains. Uh, under 25s will be saying goodbye to watches. Why do you need that when you have a phone? Um, we can say goodbye to vacuuming. I don't know where he's going with that. I'd love that one to come sooner or later. Um, but it's simply telling us that as a result of these changes, there's a lot more to come. We can say goodbye to the welfare state. We can say goodbye to retirement. We're beginning to see that these otherwise beneficial technologies are actually starting to reverberate more widely in terms of the economy, in terms of uh, society, uh, in terms of taxation, in terms of social welfare, and, and so on and so forth. So if those are some of the things we might say goodbye to, what are the things that we might say hello to in um, the next year and beyond? Uh, well, um, robot so sex is mentioned up there, I won't go there, um, <laughs> but um, uh, we can say hello to 3D printing in the home. Uh, we can say to, hello to augmented reality glasses. Google just launched theirs this week. Uh, we can say hello to robo nannies, um, biohacking, um, foldable, flexible mobile phones. We can say hello to thought control. Um, we can say hello to memory implants. We can say hello to electric sports cars, um, to personal DNA testing, to digital butlers, voice control TV. A lot of stuff that isn't just out there in the ether as kind of science fiction, tomorrow's world, wouldn't it be great if? The reality is, as guys like Ross Dawson and many others looking at the, sp the field will point out, there are already examples of this starting to happen. Uh, Personalised billboards, if you have Bluetooth on your phone, you're getting those via Bluetooth messages uh, already on your phone. So, change when it comes to the world of digital technology, we're really very much only at the beginning. We've been through the technology adoption phase, now we're in the technology application phase and we haven't seen nothing yet. So if that's the story in terms of change and as I said to you, a lot of it very interesting, much of it welcome, a lot of it something we're already entirely comfortable with and entirely uh, adopted to. What are some of the challenges that we're going to face in this extraordinary world of digital technology and digital change? In fact, it's not only will we face, these are ch challenges that we already face in many aspects of our lives. Um, the first one has to do with just the volume of data and the volume uh, of information that is out there. Um, here's a, a nice little graphic on what happens in an internet minute. In a typical minute on the internet, 47,000 apps are downloaded. There are 20 victims of identity theft. 204 million emails are sent. 61,000 hours of music are downloaded, 20 million photos are viewed, um, there are 20, 320 new Twitter accounts opened, there are 6 million views on Facebook pages, there are 2 million searches on Google in a minute, there are 1.3 million video views in an internet minute, um, and in fact, what's really interesting is what I've highlighted here at the bottom, today at the moment, the number of networked devices, as in, you know, smartphones, smart cars, etc., that are connected to the internet, equals the total population of humans in the world, six and a half, seven billion of us. By 2015, the number of network devices, things that are connected one to another, will actually be equal to more than twice the human population. Um, by 2015, it's reckoned that it'll take five years 
to view all the video crossing the internet in just one second. Um, such will be the volumes. Um, what we're seeing is the emergence of the internet of things, literally smart fridges, smart cookers, smart cars, smart computers, everything connected, measurement. It's that idea of the measured self, measured self. As we walk around with our phones, we're leaving a, tra a digital trail in the ether of where we are, of what we're doing, what, screen, what we're seeing, what we're saying, what we're texting, etc., etc. And that Internet of Things is what is now going to be the next phase of the Internet. Up until now, it's been about people talking to people, email, phone, mobile, text messages, etc. Now it's going to be about technology communicating to technology. Um, and it's going to have some very interesting uh, consequences. Um, we're going to see um, all sorts of things connected together. Um, what you eat, what you watch on TV, and what else you do in your spare time. All of these things will be generating information. In Japan, they already have toilets that read the biochemistry of your um, uh, visits and alert you to your uh, current um, levels of iron or levels of or incidence of uh, bacteria, etc, etc. And all of that information, all of that um, internet of things is going to become far more ubiquitous. We're actually going to be able to monitor ourselves at a level of detail in terms of the things we do, say, consume, share, think even perhaps. Uh, that in a way that was quite extraordinary, quite un uh, seemingly impossible in the past. But this might all leave you feeling a little bit like uh, Mr. Orwell, big brother, is watching you. And you have a degree of reason to be concerned. Because clearly one of the consequences of the Internet of Things, when in fact all of the devices that we use are recording information about everything that we are doing is that suddenly privacy becomes one of those things that we can no longer take for granted. And indeed, as we know uh, from Ross Dawson, privacy is one of the things we're already saying goodbye to in terms of our lives. Um, here's one guy who said it recently that in the very near future, your casual behavior and activities will be trackable with the precision and detail only possible today in the confines of a lab. Every device, object or surface will potentially be a sensor. The physical constraints assumed by the current legal framework and that balance the power of individuals against corporate and government interest are disappearing. The digital representation of you that was once a rough tile mosaic is coming into focus for vendors and government as a high definition crystal image. Our system of legal privacy protection is based on a world of atoms and embeds the implicit assumption that cost imposes a natural limit to the extent of surveillance. The move to bits breaks that foundational assumption in ways that are not obvious and potentially catastrophic. That's uh, T. Robb, who blogs at The Odd is Silent, quite an interesting blogger. But he's simply making the point that already we, have, we leave behind an extraordinary trail of information that it costs businesses perhaps, and certainly governments, next to nothing to accumulate, to analyze, uh, to interrogate, and to monitor. So privacy and its demise is something that is going to take some getting used to if we're prepared to let it happen. And that's one of the challenges I'll come back to later on. Um, and there's a wider context to it because one of the consequences of the demise of the Celtic Tiger is the breakdown of trust. A lot of us are a bit like um, Ben Stiller in Meet the Parents. Um, because basically, nowadays, a lot of businesses and organizations find themselves outside the circle of trust. Um, and the circle of trust is something that 
it's going to be kind of hard to get back into. And when we see, and we will see, more scare stories about privacy, about uh, people having their rights uh, transgressed and so on, because by accident or by design, by the way, because of just this accumulation of information that we're all part and parcel of, we're going to find it very difficult in business as well as in government to retain or secure the trust of the citizen. So privacy and its demise, I think it's fair to say, is one of the big challenges arising from the digital transformation, the digital revolution that we're now experiencing. But there are a few other things I want to just talk about as well. And this is kind of even uh, weirder in terms of the impact of the technologies that we are um, using. Do you remember on the say goodbye, say hello chart, um, one of the things Ross said we uh, should be saying goodbye to is focused attention. Why is that? Well, part of it is because we now live in an age of distraction. We all of us have our laptops, our iPads, our mobile phones, all of them beckoning us, tempting us away from whatever else it is we should be doing, thinking, or, or attending to. And it's having interesting consequences in terms of its impact on us in our brains, literally. When you think about the traditional left brain, right brain <laughs> dichotomy, the left brain, the rational bit, the right brain, the kind of open, holistic piece, the creative piece, um, there are some interesting things happening to the way we behave, the way we think, um, as a result of our engagement with digital technology. Um, this chap, Ian McGilchrist, has written, I think, one of the definitive books of the past decade, The Master and His Emissary, about how the left brain, right brain dichotomy um, has changed and continues to change as a result of technology, of culture, and even economics and politics. And he is one of these interesting guys. He has a PhD in, I think, English literature and a PhD in neuroscience. Um, so he has a classic left brain, right brain uh, combination there. Um, and he is seeing some interesting things happening. And some of them are, frankly, quite scary. For example, in a recent essay, he talked about this. Sometimes people seem to think that when I talk about hemispheres, this is just metaphorical. But it is not. There is evidence that autistic spectrum disorders and anorexia nervosa, both of which mimic and almost certainly involve right hemisphere deficit states, are on the increase. But it goes much further than that. It affects us all. And he tells a story of a recent talk he gave in Toronto when a member of the audience came up to the microphone and what she said struck him forcibly. She said, I am a teacher of seven to 11 year olds, she began. My colleagues and I have noticed that in the last three or four years, we have, had started, uh, we have started having to teach children how to read the human face. What's going on there? Um, these teachers reported that in just the last few years, their children had become unable to carry out tasks involving sustained attention. Tasks that 10 years ago almost every child would have been able to do easily. And when you put that together with research suggesting that children are now less empathic than they used to be, we get a startling picture. Because each of these faculties, the ability to read faces, to sustain attention and to empathise, as well as being essential to the human world, um, is particularly reliant on the right hemisphere of the brain. So their relative demise is precisely what you would expect if my hypothesis is correct. And his hypothesis is that in a technology-dominated world, it favours the left side of the brain, the analytical reductionist side of the brain, versus the uh, deductive side of the right uh, brain. So this is quite extraordinary what's happening here. Um, now, it's not to be alarmist, but it's simply to make an observation that the sheer ubiquity and availability of digital technologies and the impact that it has on all of us in terms of how we engage with technology and how we engage with one another 
that loss of attention, that loss of focus, um, that kind of um, uh, need that we all have for the little dopamine uh, boost when we get the email or we get the text message, it has interesting biochemical consequences for our brains. So we're only at the start of that process. How it impacts us in the future is it one of those challenges we're only beginning to think about. I remember back in 1969, um, a book came out by a chap called Alvin Toffler, Future Shock. Um, and he talked about a lot of things that we're now seeing. He talked about the electronic cottage. That was the idea that, for example, um, we'd all be working from home using some kind of new technology because the internet hadn't quite been invented. It. Well, it was there in DARPA for the US military, but it wasn't exactly common. Um, but he saw some of the things coming that have now happened. A third of Irish adults already using the internet to work from home. But he didn't see other things. And in fact, now that we're living with the digital technologies, we begin, begin to think about some of how it's beginning to affect us. Um, a new book out by Douglas Rushkoff is called Present Shock. You can see what he's riffing on there with the title. He's basically saying the future has already arrived um, and we need to think through what the consequences of it are. He, he talks about five interesting changes in human behavior arising from digital technology. The first of them he calls narrative collapse. The loss of linear stories and their replacement with, for example, crass reality programming or highly intelligent post-narrative shows like The Simpsons. Nobody ever gets old. With no goals to justify journeys, we get the impatient impulsiveness of the Tea Party, for example, in the US, or the unbearably patient presentism of the Occupy movement. The new path to sense-making is more like an open game than a story. And remember, the gaming industry right now is bigger than the film industry in terms of consumer spending throughout the world. So a loss of narrative, past, present, and future. There's another trend that he sees, digifrenia. Technology lets us be in more than one place, maybe even be more than oneself at the same time. Drone pilots, for example, suffer more burnout than real world pilots as they attempt to live in two worlds, home and battlefield, simultaneously. We are all becoming overwhelmed uh, until we learn to distinguish between data flows like Twitter uh, that can only be dipped into and data storage, like books or emails, that can be fully consumed. A couple of other things he sees as well. Overwinding, trying to squish huge timescales into much smaller ones, like attempting to experience a catharsis of a well-crafted five-act play in the random flash of a reality show. And there are now apps that will uh, take books, for example, and trans translate them into 140-character tweets just to save you the time. Um, packing a year's worth of retail sales expectations into a single Black Friday event, for example, in the US. Um, Real Housewives, for example, uh, the reality TV show, freezing one's age with Botox only to lose the ability to make facial expressions in the moment. Um, he then talks about fractal noia, making sense of our world entirely in the present tense by drawing connections between things, sometimes inappropriately. The conspiracy theories of the web, and we're exposed to many of them. The use of big data to predict the direction of entire populations, not in 10 years time, but in a day or two. And the frantic effort of governments to function with no grand narrative. Politics has lost its story. Politics is simply about managing the present, um, but also the emerging skill of pattern recognition. And finally, he talks about um, apocalyptico. Uh, this is the intolerance for presentism that leads us all to fantasize the grand finale. The preppers in America, the extraordinary uh, prevalence of zombie stories in, the, in popular um, uh, culture. It's all about a simpler life. One uh, unplugged from all of the, the noise, etc. that's out there. Um, and people even talk, even uh, scientists, atheists, about, you know, the singularity. Um, about how we might even upload our consciousness into robots and become these kind of cyber humans in the future. Um, um, what did somebody once call it? Uh, he called it the um, 
uh, where, whereby basically uh, people imagine that um, our, our identities can be um, uh, the equivalent, call it the rapture of the nerds, um, this idea that we would all be consumed by machines. So all of these things are narratives that people are seeing happening today as a result of the new fangledness of these technologies that we are all exposed to. And I haven't even mentioned economics, by the way. This is just social, psychosocial, biochemical impact of technology. But probably one of the biggest ones is the economic consequence. I should probably do the dialect voice here, disintermediate, disintermediate. Uh, what's happening in terms of the economy as a result of technology is something, again, we're all still coming to terms with. Um, there's talk about the productivity gap, um, where productivity is continuing to increase because of technology, not just in America, but in many other countries. But employment is stagnating or even shrinking. And that gap is something that a lot of economists are now asking, well, where is this going to go? Is technology now beginning to cannibalize the economy in terms of its of impact. And we can see it in one particular sector and we're only, only at the start of it. And that is the world of the university, of third level education. Just take a look at the extraordinary flowering of online, massive online open communities, of online universities and so on. Khan Academy, um, most undergraduates in Ireland today couldn't probably get through their exams without the Khan Academy. Um, Udacity, iTunes University, MR University, set up by some economists. MR stands for uh, Marginal Revolution. Um, Coursera, Ud Udemy, and edX. edX is an interesting one. It's a joint venture between Berkeley, MIT, and Harvard, who are now offering free courses online. Um, and in fact, on their website, it says, the future of online education for anyone, anywhere, anytime. So the whole disintermediation thing, the whole digitization impact is something that again is starting to challenge a lot of the traditional people and atom intensive services and products that have provided a great deal of employment and so on. So again, it's simply an indication of just some of the challenges that are out there. And the reality is this, and I think this is the big economic issue right now today, not the banks, not debt, not the euro, it's youth unemployment. Because we've never had a better educated cohort of young people in the world than we have today and yet, we've never had a bigger problem finding them jobs. In Ireland, youth unemployment um, has gone from 4 or 5% all of six years ago to 30% today. In Greece, it now stands at nearly 60% youth unemployment. So despite all our brilliance and our smarts and our technology, and our bailouts and our uh, troikas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, we're failing uh, an entire generation of young people. And I think that's one of the great challenges arising, not just from the digital revolution, but from the interaction between the digital revolution and the economic, social, political, and even demographic trends arising from it. So finally, just in terms of moving on from change to challenges to choices, what are some of the things that we might anticipate or even just think about this evening or in the future um, in terms of what our choices are in Ireland? Well, one of the big things we should be thinking about is, could Ireland become the privacy IFSC? Could we actually champion the consumer, champion the citizen, the individual in terms of the world of privacy. Because right now, when it comes to data, when it comes to that cloud of information you're creating with your, your smartphone, your loyalty card, your ATM, your Twitter account, your Google uh, Gmail, et cetera, et cetera, right now that's owned by uh, the big corporates. It's their information, it's their data. 
But something quite extraordinary is now happening in terms of the data discussion. We're moving from an age of CRM, customer relationship management, where basically you're the customer in the red shorts, um, to VRM, vendor relationship management, a liberation whereby, for example, if you are a Tesco club card holder, Tesco are obliged to give you all of your club card data on a memory stick so that you can take that information to somewhere else, Sainsbury's or Asda or Dunn's, and get the best deal possible. Now, it might sound like science fiction, but in fact, in the UK, there's an initiative called My Data, MI, not MY, My Data, where the UK government is mandating that um, credit card companies, mobile phone companies, energy companies, supermarkets must give you as their customer all the information they have about you back to you because it's your information, it's your data. There's a revolution happening. It's called the Intention Economy, a brilliant book by a guy called Doc Searles, whereby all of us, enabled by all of these technologies, enabled by the Internet of Things, will go from being the passive contributors to the world of data, but actually the owners of the data that we create. And that we will then be able to broker that information out through third parties or independent businesses on our behalf, anonymously if we wish, so that we are in control of the information. Think about it this way. How many times have you uh, subscribed to a service on the internet looked at the, the terms and conditions and clicked the box, I accept, without reading it. I say probably all of you all of the time, certainly I do. But that's for the convenience of the service provider. In the future, it's going to be turned around. The next Facebook, the next Google, the next Microsoft is going to be a broker of the intentions, the buying intentions of billions of people throughout the world. And there's an entire uh, cohort of businesses now bubbling up in that regard. So that's where there's an opportunity for Ireland to become the privacy IFSC. Could we become the mentors, the aggregators, the home, the cluster of the VRM, vendor relationship management industry that's about to explode in the internet, across the internet of things? Um, what other choices have, do we face? Well, a big one is the rise of the e-punt. I'm not a, not a big fan of mono pictures. They're actually usually pretty bad, for, biologically speaking. Well, we have a mono currency right now, and it's reasonable to say it has had some teething problems uh, in recent years. So why always stick with one currency? Why not invent new currencies? We saw the Bitcoin story recently, a bit of a boom and bust for sure, but it's an indicator, a harbinger if you like, of all the other things that are happening right now. Because the future of money is going to also increasingly be uh, put back in the hands of the spender. Um, take a, for example, um, the Brixton Pound. This is a currency, uh, e-currency uh, that's now created in the Brixton suburb of London. Uh, I love some very funky banknotes, David Bowie and a few others there, um, a native of Brixton, just in case you're wondering what the connection is, um, whereby they're trying to create local currencies, digital as well as paper, to retain economic value and spending within certain markets. The Bieljamar Euro from the Netherlands, invented by Christ, uh, Christ, Christian Nold, a uh, genius of a, of a creative guy, what he did was he took the Euro currency and stuck these, can you see this kind of funny grid thing around it? These are um, um, uh, chips that come on um, the underground tickets in Amsterdam. So they took them off, they're still active, they're like riffed uh, uh, stick, stuck them on five euro notes, and they, they can only, and when you read the riffed key in a local shop in Bielgemer, a suburb of, of Amsterdam, um, you get a discount, and it keeps the money circulating in the area. We also, of course, have our uh, Clonakilty Favour Exchange, which is also experimenting with ways of creating and sustaining and retaining 
economic activity in a particular area, Clannacilty obviously in this case. Um, so why not have the e-punt? I think one of the smartest things a government could do would be to create a new alternative currency. The punt, only this time with a chip attached, could even be vir entirely virtual and we just all get our little smart card with our, uh, our weekly stock of e-punts that would be used for uh, creating a new economy like Clannacilty Favour Exchange or perhaps other things as well because I'm sure there's a degree of inventiveness out there that we haven't thought about, so that we are less vulnerable to the monoculture of one currency. And I think you're going to see lots of experimentation with new types of currencies, digital currencies, definitely, but alternative currencies, um, which will be a response to, obviously, the ongoing economic crisis, but also a response to the enabling power of digital technology. Very exciting space. We in Ireland should be leading this particular experiment. Again, that's an example of where we can choose to be ahead in relation to technology. So finally, in terms of choices we can make, another choice for us in Ireland is the possibility of becoming um, 21st century monasteries. The monastery is something that we've um, traditionally associated with old Ireland, medieval Ireland, for many years, and I've visited a few of them around the country. Thousands of Europeans came to Ireland to visit our monasteries, to study, in fact, in our monasteries. Um, but what would a 21st century monastery in Ireland offer the digital world? Well, this is a little bit contrarian, but for example, what it might do is offer some escape from the noise of the digital world in which we find ourselves. Um, the promise could be come to the digital monastery, no Wi-Fi, no broadband, no signal, guaranteed. An opportunity to digitally detox from the distraction and the noise in which we find ourselves immersed and swimming. Um, I think digital detox centres will in fact be a big growth opportunity um, for uh, some entrepreneurs in, in coming months if not years. Um, and I suppose on, still on the theme of the 21st century monastery, what were monasteries? Obviously there were places of learning, they were spiritual centres, they were uh, places of healing. Um, in the new digital economy in Ireland, maybe we could choose on the theme, with the theme of digital monasteries or the 21st century monastery to do other things. We could learn to heal the divided brain. How might uh, we respond to the challenge Ian McGilchrist has identified in terms of the lurch to the left brain and all of the mental health and mental illness consequences of that? Um, for example, should we ban computers from our schools? Should we ban technology from our schools? Should we actually insist on face-to-face, -face, human to human, wetware to wetware communication? Um, completely contrarian, but a radical response to some of the things that are happening out there. In our 21st century monasteries, might we focus on ways of reconnecting the generations because we are abandoning the young generation in Europe uh, economically speaking. Um, we have to reconnect the generations. Um, it's very important that we do. Ireland still has the youngest population in Europe. I keep reminding my German colleagues and friends of this. Um, they're the, oh, one of the most rapidly aging populations in Europe. They want us to look after them when they're old. They better be nice to us now in terms of um, all the Troika and all those bailouts. Um, so again, Part of the healing could be reconnecting the generations. And finally, in our 21st century monastery, we should look at new ways of wealth creation, e-wealth creation. Wealth creation for everyone, not just for the 1%. Um, how can we use the power and the potential of digital technology, the vendor relationship revolution, the e-currency revolution to create new products and services, new ways of being, of sharing, of 
caring, of supporting, of learning, of educating in ways that go beyond just the old failed formulas in the ways that actually allow us to really put a human face on technology and to humanize digital technology. I think if we can do that, I think we can look forward to a digital future in Ireland that is also uniquely Irish, that also talks to our strengths and our, our, our preferences as a people, as a culture, and ultimately is something that we can all look forward to rather than fear or dread, uh, and something that we can all benefit from, uh, not just as consumers, but as citizens, uh, as parents, um, and as uh, neighbours, uh, and so on. So, I hope you found that uh, interesting, and obviously um, you'll be able to watch it on Facebook or, or on um, YouTube uh, later on, but if you have any questions, I'd be quite happy to take them. All right, thank you.